Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Rebecca Shamblin and she is here to enlighten me all about family history and your books you've written. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. I love talking about this topic. <laughs> Yeah. So I really, I have not dabbled in this at all. I um, was telling you before I hit record that my son, my oldest son has been really researching our family history, which to me, I I'm too lazy. I just feel like that's awesome. He's doing it. I've never, never done it, but I know there's so many websites out there now that do all that work and everything. How did you, how did you come about this? Get interested in it? Yeah, so I've actually been working on my family tree for over 20 years. Um, I sort of fell into it sideways. I was trying to get ready for a family reunion. And my mother has nine siblings, or eight siblings, sorry, and many, many, many cousins, because all the families were like that. So I was couldn't keep track of everybody. Yeah. And so I sat down to try to make a list of who was who and how they were related. And uh, the family tree kind of got out of hand after that. <laughs> Well, did you, did you get all the way back? Like, are you guys from Germany, Ireland? Like, where are you from? I am actually 75% Luxembourgish, which What's is pretty that? unusual. That, so Luxembourg is a tiny little country. It's between Belgium and France and Germany. Um, don't worry. When I have, when I do presentations, I have a slide that has a picture of the map because <laughs> no one knows where it is. <laughs> that probably pretty still tiny. wouldn't help me, sadly <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's it's smaller than Rhode Island actually the entire country um so you can just you know drive through it in in an afternoon and um I'm I'm very eager to go as an adult I went many years ago but now that I've been doing my research now I'm I'm very excited <laughs> yeah so do, have you connected with people that are there that are family or is there still family I there not so Luxembourg is such a small area that it's it's rare to connect with somebody who's also researching your family unless you really are intentionally going after that so um I will eventually but yeah it's uh the one thing I did do though is I, I got my dual citizenship so I'm now officially a dual citizen of, of America and Luxembourg and I was able to get that status for my children and my parents and my my sister and um it was just really fun I couldn't have done it without my genealogical research and it means that I now have um you know, I'm an EU citizen. We could move there if we wanted to. Oh so. my gosh. That's so cool. Is this on your mom's side or your dad's side? All the sides. <laughs> they are both from there? Yeah. Well, my parents met in a small town in um, Ozaki County, Wisconsin, and almost everyone there is Luxembourgish and, and somewhat German. That was a, a very big place for immigrants to come. In fact, uh, it's actually the sister city of Luxembourg um, in all of the United States is, is the town where I was born in Wisconsin. So it's very Luxembourgish. We have the Luxembourg American Cultural Center. We have a parade, Luxembourg Fest every year. Uh, it's uh, it's great. Oh my gosh, Luxembourg. that is so cool. So yeah. what language do they speak? Well, they have three official languages. So English and French, but also Luxembourgish, which is their national language. It's a distinct language. Uh, very similar to German and French, because mostly they were constantly invaded um, by whoever was a leading military power at any given time. So um, it's similar to German enough that I could understand it. When I was a kid, I could talk to my grandpa in German and he could talk in Luxembourgish and we could sort of get a sense of what the other person was saying. He grew up speaking Luxembourgish in the home, even though he was born in Wisconsin. Um, they didn't learn English until they went to school, even though they were here. So did you learn it? Do you, I mean, do you know it like fluent or? Oh gosh, I wish I did. I have downloaded a couple apps and I've learned the colors and how to say hello, Moyen. <laughs> and uh, I think my children have uh, learned more of it than I have. I do want to learn it. It's kind of a dying language given the the rarity um, of, of descendants. So. So are your parents just like, what, what else did you find out? Tell us about our, I mean, are they, have they been doing it too? Or this is just all you? It's mostly me. Mostly you get like one person in the family who gets a little obsessed with genealogy and then goes nuts with it. It's funny that you use the word dabble because I don't know anyone who dabbles in genealogy. You're either Dive not in. in at all or you're all in. <laughs> it's all you can think about. And I think part of that is just by nature because when you're, you know, flying through you know, 17th century baptism records, you need to know what names to look for and they have to all be in your head. You can't just be comparing against a list. And so I think it's just by nature, you end up trying to hold everything in your head at one time. And it's such a treasure hunt. 
Uh, we always joke about dopamine hits, like finding that that new record or breaking through a brick wall. So as we call it, if you've been stuck somewhere in your tree and you finally break through, you're breaking through a brick wall. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. And it's um, changed okay. over the years, you know, having started so many years ago, even then there were a lot of online records, but you had to go in person to a lot of these archives. And now there's so much online um, especially uh, the Mormons, they run familysearch.org, which is a completely free website. And they go all over the world scanning important historical family documents, like even to the, the tiniest church in the tiniest town in, in Europe. They'll go in there and scan it and just make it available for free. Is online. that only if you're Mormon? No. Oh, bad. really? Yeah, oh, there are select records that are only for Mormons, but most, most anybody could go. You just need a free account. And um, they just you know, do it to help. And, um, and there are family history centers all over the country that can help you if you're just trying to get started. There's always volunteers there and they will help you look through all the records and there's so much possible. And now with AI, mm -hmm. we're using that a lot more to index the information. So it used to be that you had to know, oh, he was born in the 1890s. I'm going to look through every 1890 baptism record until I find him. Now we have computers that are learning to read that handwriting and make everything so much faster and easier. Holy crap. Yeah. I think yeah. AI is so fascinating yes. and I'm not scared of it. I just, I, it blows your mind what it can do. So yeah. gosh, I just feel like I'm so confused about it. I know there's ancestry.com and, and now you said there's also the other site. Do they have, is it like a library? It, I mean, in the computer, is that what it is? So you still have to dig. Yeah, you still have to dig. So um, Ancestry.com is probably one of the, it's one of my favorites for getting started. Um, it has, it has, it is two things. It is a way for you to keep and build your family tree. Like you can enter in things, even if it's just stuff your grandma told you, you can just type it in and put it in your tree and then share your tree. But it is also a database of records that you can search and they're constantly adding new records to the database. Um, so the tree parts are all free. Uh, if you want to see the records, then uh, you need a subscription. Um, but there, there's so much there and they're really good. Their algorithms are just fantastic at making connections and um, <clears throat> offering what they call hints. So if you put in you and your parents and your grandparents, at least great grandparents, if you know them, and you enter that into Ancestry and give it a day or so, it will come back and suggest things based on what everyone else has built in their tree. Say, hey, you have John Smith. We actually have a John Smith here. He was probably married to Mary Doe. And then you can investigate that and see if that's true or not. And it helps you with your research, again, using algorithms and technology we didn't have years ago. It's mm. fascinating. So Ancestry is a good one to start with. Um, I like to use software called Family Tree Maker. And that one is an offline program. And that is so my family tree is on my computer. With Ancestry, everything's up in the cloud and you don't really have control over it. Um, so I prefer to have control over my tree and be able to back it up and things like that. So I prefer Family Tree Maker software. What was the biggest surprise that you came across when you were doing this? Oh, gosh. I should have a, a pat answer for that by now because people do like to hear that stuff. <laughs> Let's see. And things that are uh, appropriate to talk about because there's definitely skeletons in the family closets that you will discover. Uh, for me, it's been really interesting to learn about um, just even occupations back then. So I had an ancestor. My great-great-grandfather was listed as, um, or triple great, uh, a, a toll gate keeper. I was like, I don't really know a lot about that. Let me dig a little. And it turns out he, they used to build plank roads, like roads out of wood. And uh, it was, it was an interesting experiment. Didn't go well, but they cost money and they were private. So the people who built them would plop somebody on either end and charge you a penny and axle, except on Sundays when you're going to church to go by. And so this man had to be available 24 seven to collect these pennies and, and help farmers out of the mud that always grew because plank roads are a terrible idea. Yeah. Yeah. Or like a fireman. When I thought, when I saw he was a fireman in the census, I thought, Oh, he fights fire. No, his job was to keep fires going in the, um, in the electrical company that powered the streetcars. They needed fire to be um, on all the time. So his job was to build fire, not fight it. So little things like that assumptions you make and what you learn is fascinating to me. Oh my gosh. Have you always loved history? I haven't actually. Uh, it was an interesting path here. I was more of a computer geek uh, in high school and college and college is when I sort of fell into this. 
And um, it's a very personal history. You know, you, you do have to learn to add context and think about, you know, why were Luxembourgish immigrants coming at that time and how did the Civil War affect this whole town? But I love the personal touch and sitting there imagining my specific ancestors sitting there or I really love finding the name of the ship that they immigrated on. And then you can look for paintings or photographs of the ships, depending on when it was. So I have paintings of the real ship and I can imagine my ancestor on the bow of that ship and thinking of the enormity of her decision to cross an ocean by herself and, yeah. and what she found when she got here. And um, that that is really interesting to me. So what year did they come here and why Wisconsin? No offense, Wisconsin. Just why though? <laughs> Just why? why? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, almost all of my ancestors came over about the mid 1800s, uh, from, from Luxembourg specifically, there were a couple of reasons. There was a drought for several years. So the, the crops just weren't producing enough food for everybody and they couldn't make their wine in the, in the Moselle River Valley, but also the, uh, they changed the law trying to be more fair. So they said, you can't just, um, you uh, the oldest child in the family doesn't automatically inherit the farm. Now we should share it. You know, every, every child should get a part of the farm. Within one or two generations, there wasn't a farm left that was big enough to sustain a family because they kept getting split every generation. Oh. So it was uh, ex excellent intentions, but it meant that many, many people left Luxembourg altogether uh, in search of the new world. Yeah. So why did they pick Wisconsin? Yeah, I don't know why the original ones did, but often the family or a whole town would send a scout. So one brave young man would across the ocean and you know usually they were landing and then um getting to Chicago or Milwaukee and so my ancestors are all about 45 minutes north of Milwaukee and they would just kind of walk or ride until they found what looks like some good wilderness and if they found a, a decent place they would send letters back and some of them traveled all the way back to help everybody come so in the town where I was born which is called Belgium which is very confusing <laughs> um, at the time uh Luxembourg had been split up by the Treaty of London. And so a big chunk of their land was given to Belgium, the country of Belgium. So the people who came over here were, were technically legally Belgians, but they were all Luxembourgers in their hearts. So they made Oh my gosh. I bet they were so nervous and excited to come here until they experienced wow. winter. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they're well, like, what the heck was that scout thinking? <laughs> but there was so much land and there was so much wood. So wood was actually fairly expensive in, in Luxembourg. And so when they got here, there's a, a quote from one of the early pioneers who was writing about it. He said that he was writing about how they were cutting down trees just to get them out of the way and then burning them just to get rid of the wood. They couldn't get rid of the wood fast enough. And the trees were so big, if one fell over, a man could stand behind it and you wouldn't see him. And that the women wept to see such riches go up in smoke. And so when the people back home in Luxembourg were hearing these stories and reading about them in newspapers, they, they were like, hey, I got to get a piece of that. Let's head over. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I, and I have never really been into history, but stuff like that is, makes it interesting, you know, cause yeah. it makes it more tangible when you hear the stories and think those are, the, those are my people. Those are yeah. the people that I came from that were doing things used to be so hard. I don't think people realize I take care of the elderly and I hear these stories, you know, of how much effort it took just to take a bath, you know? Yes. Uh, it's crazy. The kids nowadays, kids nowadays, <laughs> these days. they have it. They don't realize. Okay. Um, I wrote down cause I wanted to ask you, sure. you help people find their birth families through DNA. Yeah. Okay. How do you do that? How do you do that? that? Yeah, that is incredibly satisfying and heartwarming and important work. Uh, I haven't done a lot of, I think maybe three or four people I've helped so far and what it, you know, a lot of people, They'll test their DNA to see, oh, I'm 40% Scottish. And then they just kind of shrug and they don't know what to do after that. And the really <laughs> valuable parts of these DNA tests are the shared matches. Who else do you share DNA with? And for every individual person you share with, who else do both of you share somebody with? And when you analyze all of those connections and sort of sort them out and label them and you look for the patterns, then you can start to see where the different bloodlines were coming out. So um, Ancestry DNA has a color coding system and I use that. So for the, for the people I can identify, either because they have uploaded a family tree and I can compare and see, oh, you know, they're descended from this person, or I can see, well, they share 
DNA with me and all of my career ancestors, they must be a career. Even though I don't know which one they are, they're a career. We all have the same. And so when you start label enough of them and you start doing eliminations and saying, okay, well, they're a career, but not a Schmidt. So they must have come into the tree from this side. And uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, thinking and a lot of on the ground work. Um, but it's amazing what's possible that was never possible before. And yeah. it helps, you know, even when you're not talking about adoptions, it helps prove things that I could never prove with documentation. So I had an ancestor, John Creer, uh, who had very conflicting data from his life here in Wisconsin about and his life back in Luxembourg. Very different birth dates and years, like actually carved on his tombstone. So mistakes are very, very common. And you usually just sort of shrug them away. But carved on a tombstone is pretty is pretty uh, set in stone. So I started to suspect these were two different men with the same name. And how could we really know that the man who left Luxembourg is the same man who landed in Wisconsin and founded my family? And no matter how many, you know, how much paperwork I could dig up, there was no way to really know. It was, it was a leap of faith until DNA. And I was very luckily, I was able to test my great grandmother's sister's DNA, who is still with us, um, and uh, I was able to connect to a family that is back in Luxembourg that would not, this connection would not exist if it were not the same John Creer and connecting them up. And that's, that's evidence you can't get any other way. It was, it was so exciting. <laughs> so what do you mean you got it from her? Like you had her swab and mm -hmm. you sent it in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause she, she's luckily very alive and, and sharp as attack and very helpful. I can send pictures to her son and he will show them and she'll be like, oh yeah, I know who that is. And that was on Carla's back porch. That was in her house in Fort Washington. And she just remembers <laughs> everything. It's, it's a treasure. But yeah, um, these DNA tests are so easy. You basically spit into the, to the little sample thing and send it away and you can find so much. Have you seen, I don't know if you get into true crime and stuff, but have you seen that that's the, well, new to me, you <laughs> see that there's like a few experts and they can find in these cold cases just yeah. by family D. Oh, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. I just read an article yesterday about a 30 year old cold case that was solved using that. And uh, it's fascinating to me. I haven't done a uh, forensic DNA analysis before, but I've often thought about trying to delve because wow. <laughs> right. Is that something that you'd have to go to school for? I mean, do you have to have like a biology or some kind of background to do that kind of stuff? Not that I know about. I mean, you can get degrees in genealogy um, and you can get certifications in, in genealogy. Um, but I think there are plenty of people out there who are self-taught, sort of like me. I was self-taught. I came up with my own rubric for organizing the DNA results and trying to draw conclusions from that. So I think it's a mix. <laughs> Is it your job? Is this your job? Uh, I'm trying to make it my job. <laughs> uh, I'm also a photographer and uh, I've been a genealogist for so many years, but um, a few years ago, I wrote my first family history book. So like you were talking about, having the stories is such an important part of this because just a list of names and dates, it doesn't draw the interest of anyone, but the most obsessed of us. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I worked on a book. And so this is one of them. And um, I went all in and I, I had data, I had pictures, I had all sorts of things. Um, and I went nuts with it and people were really excited about that book. And so uh, when I wrote another one, they kept asking how I did that. And so I did a Zoom and I did a blog post. And eventually um, I actually wrote a book about how I did it. Leaving and, uh, a legacy. Turn your family tree into a family book. So it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to do it. Absolutely. Do you, yeah. do you want to just do it for people? Is that your goal? Or do you want people to know how to do it? Uh, both. The book is about <laughs> teaching them how to do it. Uh, um, yeah. It, and it's been an amazing journey. It only came out last fall and it's been so popular. I'm now partnered with Family Tree Maker. They're now selling the book through their website. And I was able to join them at a very large genealogy conference a couple of weeks ago. And um, so th that's, this book is what has made me think I could make a career out of this and make a full-time living. Um, I also love doing research for people. I have several clients. Um, sometimes they come here and I show them how to do it. Sometimes they just say, hey, let me know what you find. Send me an invoice every couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be me. <laughs> Not that I, I have money. I just feel like you do it. <laughs> 
Well, because well, you know what to look for. I do. You can save so much time when you know what to look for and how to do it. And that's part of what I'm trying to do with the books too, is, is help people. If I had known then what I know now, I could have saved so much effort. And the more people know what they're doing, um, the more we can all help each other. So on Ancestry and many other sites, you can have a public tree or a private one. I really encourage people to be public because the more we connect, the more we work together. I've put together small research groups for the different family lines that I research. And, you know, they wouldn't have been possible if we were all hunkered down in our own little corners of the internet. So I love working together with people. So what do you say to the person that is like, my life is private. I don't want to open it all up and have all these, you know, the riffraff, <laughs> <laughs> the family you don't want to be associated with, you know, yeah, contact yeah. me or so what do you say to them if, if they don't want their information out there, but you think it's useful, you know, you yeah. think it could help. So the first thing I would say is it's totally your call. Like everybody makes their own decision. There's not a right answer, but I will say ancestry and other websites automatically hide information for anybody living. So if you go look on my public tree, you're not going to find me. Um, it's just going to have a an, an icon there saying living person. And so oh. they, they try to address this concern automatically with the software. But then you can also mark entire people as private. So if you have found a surprise branch on your tree, you can research <laughs> it. But uh, just keep it private so you're the only one who sees it. That's really interesting. Does yeah. it tell you when you're in there? Does it have like a pop-up? Like there's somebody out there that we think is your relative. Can you scope them out? <laughs> so to, to a degree. So Ancestry has those hints. So if you have built an entire tree with, with these two parents and these four kids and someone else has that exact tree and they have a fifth kid, Ancestry is going to say, hey, you might want to check this out. Here's a possible um, family member to look at. And the, the really important thing is to look at that word possible because so often, especially new people just accept hints as fact and they just put it in the tree and they move on. And one small error can just propagate throughout the internet. So oh, quickly. sure. Yeah. And somehow the, fi the, the fixes never propagate quite as quickly. So um, most of us who've been around for a while are constantly urging the newbies to please use it as, as a guide, as a hint and not as a fact. Right. Oh my gosh. I just can't even imagine all that. Who's your demographic? Like who's, who's the most interested in all this? Is it everybody? All ages? No, it's, it's retired people. <laughs> <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> even if they were interested, you know, their whole lives, they usually say I'm too busy. I got to wait to settle down until I, you know, after I'm retired, then I'm really going to focus on this. And so that's, that's generally who I work with. Um, so they always are surprised that I'm uh, quite as young as I am. And so I have to, sh um, show my stripes. I've been doing it for a while. I promise. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I told you before we hit record that my son, my oldest son, like he's not even 30 yet, you know, and he, I don't know what made him get interested. I didn't even ask him. He just said, I've just been dabbling and I found, you know, these people here and these people here. And I was like, really tell me more. And it's interesting what you find out, but it sounds like there's so many resources out there now that will make it easier and faster. Yes. And yeah, and the more we, and the more the resources and technology are are evolving, I think the more people we can draw in, people like you or people like I have family members who certainly are not going to go look at a family tree on a website, but they will flip through my book. Mm. And the easier we make it to make books, the better that goes. So Family Tree Maker is a software I mentioned earlier that I use. They have a plugin. So it's by a different company, but they work with that. And so this plugin is called Family Book Creator. It reaches into your Family Tree Maker data, pulls out all the data and the pictures and and creates a book for you automatically in just like minutes. Wow. And that has been amazing to see people, you know, sort of a, a comprehend what is possible because I think so much Family Tree research is just trapped on a bookshelf or on a, a hard drive. And especially when you're talking about people who are getting advanced in age, sometimes they pass away and there's no one to pick that up and their life's work is just sitting there. And so I, one of my passions is to help people make these books so that their hard work is preserved for them and for their family and for everybody else out in the world who might be researching that family. Yeah. Have you seen people get reunited with loved oh. ones that they didn't know they knew? What thing? I haven't personally seen it. I've certainly read so many stories mm -hmm. about it. Um, I will say that the people I have helped, um, often they're not quite ready to make contact. They're looking for information. They're looking for history. They're looking to see how they belong in the world, but they're not always ready to interact in that way. 
And, um, right. Well, yeah, I know so a I, lot of people, um, especially people that are adopted, mm-hmm. you know, if they start having health concerns or whatever, that's a lot of the reason why they start delving. Cause they want to know what their medical history is. If their parents mm-hmm. never had, you know, they have the closed adoption type of stuff, but mm-hmm. what do you think is the main reason people are looking, what are they looking for? Oh, I think they want to connect. They want to know their place in the world. Um, you know, there's definitely medical concerns, but from the people I've personally interacted with, um, one of them just told me, you know, I just want to know if I was wanted, you know, because many people, you know, who were adopted feel that, you know, they weren't wanted and that's why they were adopted. And almost to to a case, in every case, it's been, no, you were so loved that they, they wanted so much for you. They wanted more than they could give you. So mm-hmm. this is the best they could give you. And um, that's usually the story that I see. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. I can't imagine all the great stories that come from all of this research that you have found with your family and then just that other people find. Cause you know, there's a generation out there that they like to sweep things under the carpet, you know, like, Oh, yes, uncle Ray, do. we don't talk about uncle Ray. <laughs> but- I mean, let's talk about Bruno. <laughs> Yeah. It's like it's nosy people. That's I that's why I would be looking. I'd be like, give me the dirt. I want to find out what's going on. It's it's delicate and it's it's definitely something I was just talking about this the other day with another genealogical speaker. So I also I also teach and do presentations and webinars. And so we were chatting about that because she's also been asked, what do I do when I find the skeleton in the closet? Do I have to hide it? Am I obligated to bring it to light? And it's of course case by case. But I usually say, so I have an ancestor in one of my books who was alcoholic. It was his primary identifier for every person I interviewed, everyone in the family and outside the family. The first thing they would say was that he was a drinker. And the idea of writing this book about him and not talking about that felt so disingenuous and so contrary to what we want for history, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That I felt I have to address this but I wanted to do it in a sensitive way. So I tried to dig deeper. I, you know, I found out he had a medical condition that was very painful. So maybe he was self-medicating. I got um, quotes from his children saying he never drank at home, only at the bars and that he wasn't abusive. You know, I, the, there were, there were elements I'd wanted to show. Oh, and that his, he had a family history. I found evidence of his dad and his grandfather also having um, problems with alcoholism. So, you know, he had, nature and nurture working against him here. And so there were a lot of factors in the person he was, and he was human like anyone. He had human flaws. So I tried to show that in the book um, Mm -hmm. fairly and uh, with respect. He's just very thirsty. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He He just thirsty all the time. (laughs) Yeah. And hopefully doing it like that um, doesn't embarrass anybody because, you know, you're talking about that generation, you know, there's people who don't want that to be out there in the world in public and in print. And so you want to be as sensitive as you can about that. Now right. I focus on ancestry books, not descendant books. So it's less of an issue for me. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're talking about, you know, secret babies and things like that for people who are living, I think it's a, a much more delicate situation. Yeah. You know, I have a funny story about that too, because my daughter, when she was born, I named her Delaney. And I just always loved that name because I watched China beach and Dana Delaney was on it. And I just thought Delaney sure. was a neat name. Come to find out through research, the Delaney's, it was the last name in our family. I did not know that. And they were bootleggers. And so everybody was like, we don't talk about the Delaney's. And then here I named my kid Delaney and everybody, my grandpa and my grandpa's relatives were like, did you name her that because of the Delaney? Oh <laughs> like, no, but it was just funny that they were bootleggers. I thought it was just so funny because yeah. when you hear terms like that, it's like, so long ago, but it really wasn't, it really wasn't that long ago, you know, prohibition and all that stuff. Yeah. It's just funny how those things come into play though. Yeah, meant to be, cause that's not a common first name. So you wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. That. I just thought it was so funny, but anyway, <laughs> so yeah, tell people how they can find you if they want to use your services or if they want your book, just give, let's hear it all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So my website is my name. So www.rebeccashamblin.com. And you're going to see sort of my my different branches there and one of them being an author. So you can order my books directly on my website. So I have the original book and then I have a workbook that goes with it. So if you're a person who likes checklists and um, very orderly note taking like I do, uh, you can find those there. 
And then I also have other tools like that you can download that work well with, with the things that I've written. So if you want to do a book exactly like mine, you can download that template, things like that. Um, and then you can also uh, purchase one-on-one -on -one help from me. So I've been doing Zooms like that for people uh, half, on, half an hour at a time. And then you'll also see uh, my work as a speaker. So for example, right now I am doing a five-month workshop, one month, uh, one Zoom a month for two societies called the Kin Seekers and the Pathfinders. And we are step-by-step -step working through the process of using Family Book Creator, which is the software I mentioned. And so each month we're, we're doing a little bit more of the process and then they go back home and practice and come back a month later and learn the next part. And so things like that, um, I really love that ongoing connection with people. So you can see that and then you can see a schedule of my upcoming engagements. And then I'm also on Facebook, um, which is probably a, the, the best way to get the most up-to-date information about events and things like that. And then I have a mailing list on the website. That's, <laughs> that's the way to, to get uh, push notifications instead of having to go seek them out. Oh, that's awesome. You're everywhere. That's I'm great everywhere. though. I mean, and I'm in, I'm, yeah, <laughs> that's wonderful. You have a beautiful smile, by the way. Oh, thank um, you. It's well, thank mom. you so much. <laughs> Panda down from generate. <laughs> <laughs> well, make sure you send me everything so I can put it in the show notes. So everybody knows how to find you. It was such a pleasure. I love what you're doing. I just think it's amazing. And I hope everything takes off for you and that can be your job. Thank you so much. I love the conversation. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye.